China and France have agreed to deepen their cooperation in third-party markets. Chinese President Xi Jinping and French President Emmanuel Macron witnessed the exchange of documents, including one on exactly this subject. President Xi was on the last stop of his six-day visit to Europe to forge a more solid, stable and vibrant partnership with Europe. Now, during his visit, France also decided to align its industrial development plan, the Industry of the Future initiative with China's Made in China 2025, a guideline which has been strongly criticized by the U.S. government in its trade dispute with China. What does it mean when the two countries, meaning China and France, step up collaboration in third-party markets and dovetail their industry policies? What are the obstacles and challenges? Joining me to discuss this topic in the Beijing studio is Professor Wang Yiwei, a Jean Monnet chair at the Research Center for European Studies at Rimini. University in Beijing and from Paris, Professor Douglas Yates at uh, the American Graduate School in Paris. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Let me start by highlighting something which uh, was very new in China's political development, which was uh, the government work report by Chinese Premier Li Keqiang uh, in the uh, just concluded two sessions where he talked about third party cooperation for the first time in the report. He said China uh, strives to strengthen international cooperation on production capacity and expand third-party market cooperation. So as I said, this is the very first time that China puts such a term into its government work report. Professor Wang, what does that mean? What does third-party collaboration exactly mean for China and who are the other three part two parties? Well, actually, France is the first country to sign the uh, cooperation agreement with the third-party market with the Chinese government. The meaning is uh, they've turned the competition into cooperation because the China developing so rapidly in Africa, which traditionally France would make a huge influence. And they worry about that, the cause of the new colonialism. Actually, uh, Chinese uh, advantage is uh, like capacity, uh, very efficient, and uh, even te technology or uh, capital. But the France, that still uh, traditional uh, leverage is very, 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 uh, uh, I think, uh, impressive, uh, in, uh, particularly in, Fran uh, in the uh, Franco countries. Uh, they have the high standard, they have technology, we, we, how to cooperate uh, to turn this competition into the cooperation. I think that's the, basically the idea of the, co uh, the third party market. And because of the France, in general, they cannot support the Bell Road initiative, but de facto, uh, I think uh, third party market is a good way to uh, uh, cooperate with mm -hmm. France. France has yet to sign up to the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, whereas Italy has as the first member of the G7, which just happened over the weekend. Now, uh, there is some criticism of this term, third party collaborate or third party markets. For instance, one uh, opinion is that the official term for that cooperation is third party market cooperation, which is slightly more neutral name for what the Chinese media often bluntly call participation in the Belt and Road Initiative. The idea is to promote, to promote partly to demonstrate that the Belt and Road Initiative is open for all countries and deflect the criticism that it is to exclusively benefit Chinese business interests. Uh, Professor Wang, uh, how, what do you think of this, uh, this kind of opinion? What is the relationship between third-party market collaboration and the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, the third-party market, uh, this concept or idea is put forward earlier than the Belt and Road Initiative. And it's more focused on the, put the European high standard to match the local conditions. Uh, I think that I think it's a Belt and Road Initiative is trying to do that because we should turn the bilateral cooperation into more multilateral. Uh, participation. But and it's not the same thing. Uh, of course, the Bell Road Initiative is a more general, more broad picture. The third party market particularly focuses on the cooperation with the uh, G7 countries mm -hmm. to discover the uh, developing countries' market. Okay. At the same time, the China and France work together to uh, win the nuclear. A planned deal in the UK is also a good example. Mm -hmm. so, so, Professor Yates, let me go to you. What do you think of this move by the French government to deepen, to decide to deepen their collaboration with China in third party markets without actually signing on to the Belt and Road Initiative? What does that say to you? Well, it says that France is taking the position of negotiations. So, it doesn't want to sign yet. 
because it's got some preconditions and it wants to try to negotiate some of those preconditions. Some of its preconditions, I think, are negotiable. That means it will renounce them in order to get other things. But I think it's a good sign because it shows France has ambitions for this. Um, I think Italy also had ambitions, but they were perfectly satisfied with promises of making the Port de Trieste an important entry point. France, with France, it's a little more subtle. It's not so much a question of a, of a port, and France was not, is not in the same position as Italy. France's objective, and the reason it did not sign, is France wants a multilateral signature and wants to do a deal between the mm -hmm. EU and China. Yeah. In this sense, Italy's signature is looked at as being a Trojan horse. Um, do you think the fact that France signed up with China to deepen third-party cooperation is exactly a reflection of that kind of concern that, just mentioned, that you just mentioned? And why is France particularly interested in this part? Basically, this time they're signing to deepen that cooperation. Actually, the two sides signed a document to start such cooperation way back in 2015. Yeah, it, when it comes to third party markets, I think France and China are on the same page. That is, I believe that they want to have co-development, for example, for France in Sub-Saharan Africa. China has been making massive investments in infrastructure in Sub-Saharan Africa that's going to help those countries uh, get out of poverty and develop. France doesn't have the same ability anymore to make those kinds of infrastructural investments. So this is a good example of win-win, uh, where if France and China, both participating, France in the form of Europe, in the Belt uh, and Road Initiative, are able to bring development and co-development to Africa, this is good for France, because Europe, as you know, is extremely concerned that low levels of development and environmental degradation in Africa are leading to this migration crisis. Okay, there, there leads a big uh, question here. Professor Wang, what are the challenges to really uh, deepen the cooperation between China and Africa, uh, between China and France, say, in Africa? Because the two countries, uh, the two many companies of these two countries can be competitors, right? And uh, we have very different standards in terms of uh, environmental um, protection or in terms of some other standards. How in practice can the two companies from these two countries actually cooperate in Africa? First, the uh, obstacle is uh, uh, distrust, uh, not just between China and France, even between African countries uh, with uh, France. They claim that uh, we cannot cooperate with the former colonist country. Uh, even some uh, countries, uh, uh, NGOs, claim China as a new uh, uh, colonialism. So the old and the new colonialism uh, cooperate with uh, uh, the weak side, and we are very, very uncomfortable about that. Uh, so uh, second uh, obstacle is, of course, uh, you mentioned about the high standard of the uh, France and the European. And uh, African countries, basically, the, the, the need is to uh, lift the poverty, they need infrastructure. Uh, how can put uh, so much high standard into the local uh, con uh, con conditions which may be suffered of the lack of electricity? Half of the population in today's world uh, cannot access the internet, most of them gathered in uh, Africa. So this is reality. The Chinese approach, I think, is between uh, we can build the roads first and then with a high standard. At the same time, we need to build in some swimming pool to train the people to swim in and then go to the sea to swim. This is the high standard and the market principle. So that's, I think, is very workable. Uh, I think the France will right. understand. Okay. Professor Yates, how do you look at the, the, the two points that uh, Professor Wang mentioned? First of all, about the kind of negative feeling or mistrust by some of the uh, third party um, participants or, or members towards uh, former colo uh, colonializer and uh, towards China, possibly, and then the kind of discrepancy in standards and also in the strings that could be attached to this kind of investment. Well, I can speak of this in an evolutionary principle because I've been watching this now for about 18 years. The initial response of European colonial powers, former colonial powers, was fear that China was coming in and was going to take over. And I think that now uh, time has passed and I think uh, Chinese investments in Africa have become normalized. And we're seeing this through a series of partnerships 
where you've got Chinese businesses and European businesses working on big development projects, big energy projects, on pipelines, mm -hmm. on roads, on offshore uh, oil exploration together by either sharing equity, if not sharing crews. So um, for me, I mean, what I find funny in the distrust is that the European and American companies um, pretend to be national, but they're not. And of course, the Chinese companies pretend to be private, but they're not. And this creates mistrust because there's official discourses on both sides which are ingenuine, but, but which you know, reflect I, I domestic have to, needs. But I have to um, mm. mention this point. According to a uh, report done of Chinese investment in Africa by, by the uh, auditing firm McKinsey, actually the great majority of investment done in Africa by Chinese companies come from private companies. So Douglas, yes, um, just well, for your reference. That's right. So, I mean, when I, what, my, what my comment is about are the perceptions that a company can be national mm -hmm. or be private and that it's a choice of one or the other. Clearly, when a French company is in Africa, it's representing for better or worse France. Whoever happens to own it and whoever mm -hmm. happens to be better. What about the standards? And it's what about the confusion. different standards? Yeah, so um, I think that there's a lot of hypocrisy when Chinese firms are accused of exploiting labor or being environmentally insensitive. There's an effort to make progress. I believe there's an official discourse for the environment. But if you go to the Niger Delta, you're not going to see a legacy of clean oil development. And if you go to the Congo rainforest, you're not going to see a legacy of sustainable logging. So I think there's a lot of hypocrisy uh, in uh, accusations that Chinese corporations are worse. Mm -hmm. I think what we do need, and this is the hope, yeah. is through multilateralism to become partners in protecting the climate, protecting the forest, right. protecting the fisheries. Okay, yeah. I, think, I think Chinese companies also have to take more uh, attention into environmental issues and ecological protection. Fa mm -hmm. Last question, real briefly, uh, Professor Wan, about uh, the dovetailing of industrial policies between France and China, especially about this uh, Made in China 2025, which has been so much demonized by the United States. What does that say now that France wants to align its policy with China? First of all, about the environment protection, I think that China too pretty well because uh, uh, high, uh, green technology, China will uh, take a leading role. Uh, most of, uh, I think that more than two-thirds of the growing green land in today's world is uh, because of the Chinese contribution including we do not in China, but also in Africa and everywhere. So it's good to contribute to the World, uh, United Nations 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which you know, France also uh, highlights. Okay, about the Made in China 2025, I think the uh, U.S. are uh, very against of that because the U.S., they have the uh, hegemonic system. Uh, the many alliance, the six, more than six countries rely on the U.S. to pro protect them securely, and they're very worried about the dual use. Like the 5G, Huawei, this is uh, revolution for, for, uh, for difficult for the U.S. to spy the alliance. But France is not such ambitions of the uh, burden of the responsibility for that. The France, you know, in the other European countries is also very worried about, they are not just okay. uh, like behind of the U.S., even behind of China, R&D, R &D, digital economy, AI. So the uh, French and the uh, European companies need to work together with Chinese to uh, push forward. And then they want to learn and, even and from the Chinese versa. model. Yeah. State, state should play some role, not just the uh, private companies. All right, we have to leave it there. Many thanks to my guests, Wang Yiwei and Jean Monet, Chair Professor at Renmin University and from Paris, Douglas Yates at American Graduate School in Paris.